Aurore Troussel. Uh, Aurore Troussel is a PhD candidate uh, at the Cyber Justice Laboratory as well as at HEC Paris. Aurore. Thank you. So indeed, I will present you a literature review on the use of virtual hearings during the pandemic. Uh, I will do a presentation in three parts. First, I will provide you an overview of the literature review I did. Then I will uh, focus on the adoption of virtual hearings during the pandemic. And finally, I will try to provide some answers to the question, what have we learned from this accelerated experience? So um, I used keyword search and legal database uh, as well as Google Scholar to, uh, to do this literature review, uh, mainly in English and French. So I reviewed the 53 sources, including scientific books, articles, uh, research studies, and governments and court reports, uh, as well as some great literature, such as interactive maps uh, on which courts uh, were using virtual hearings during the pandemic. So most of the sources I used relate to Canada, the US, the UK, France, and Australia. And I wanted to show that the composition of the literature review changed since uh, the beginning of the pandemic. So as you can see uh, below, before the pandemic, uh, the, the literature was mainly composed of articles and books. While since the pandemic, we see that governments and courts started to do reports and also that great literature uh, really um, emerged on virtual hearings, meaning that there are lots of repository and interactive maps um, that have been published. So what is also interesting to highlight is that the topics of interest uh, in the literature changed since uh, the beginning of the pandemic. So before, uh, the literature mainly focused on the risks for individual rights related to the use of virtual hearings, but also on immigration law and on the evaluation of the technology used uh, in virtual hearings and in, courtroom, in courtrooms uh, in general. While after the beginning of the pandemic, most of the literature is very like uh, oriented towards the evaluation of uh, what is uh, implemented by courts. And we can see that a lot of empirical studies have been published since uh, the beginning of the pandemic, and as well as a lot of recommendation. And uh, also since the beginning of the pandemic, courts, um, court staff, arbitrators and judges started to contribute uh, to this literature, uh, which is very interesting for us as a researcher. So in this presentation, I will focus on the literature which reflects uh, the accelerated experience of virtual hearings of courts during the pandemic. So in the last two years. Uh, first, I wanted to uh, refer to an article from Frederick Lederer, which focus on uh, the, the move from technology augmented courtrooms to virtual hearings uh, during the pandemic. So as you can see on the left of the screen, uh, it's a, a picture of a courtroom which is um, enabled by technological tools and which allow for some remote hearings to take place. While on the right of the screen, you can recognize that this is a Zoom uh, software uh, video conferencing. So this is really a virtual hearings, meaning that there is uh, no physical presence and everyone is, uh, is uh, doing his part online. So indeed, like the uh, adoption of virtual hearings during the pandemic rely on new tools because until recently, video conferencing required expensive and dedicated hardware, which were installed in, installed in courtrooms. While now, um, due to the advent of software-based video conferencing and applications such as Zoom or Microsoft Teams or Google Meet, uh, you can really like do video conferencing easily by having access to internet or to a connected device such as a laptop or even a smartphone. So this really changed the, uh, the configuration of uh, the justice system during the pandemic. And I use this statistic from the National Center for State Courts, uh, which shows that 70% of the respondents, uh, which were part of the uh, legal system, 
um, reported using video conferencing services at least once uh, during the pandemic. So um, I also wanted to show that the adoption of virtual hearings went really global during the pandemic. So this is highlighted by a report by the OECD, which shows that lots of countries started to use virtual hearings during the pandemic for the first time. So we see that this is not something that is only used like in North America or in Europe, but also in South America and uh, in Asian countries. Um, also, I wanted to provide the example of the European Court of Justice, uh, which switched to uh, virtual hearings very quickly in response to the crisis. So, for example, between 2020 and 2021, they used uh, virtual hearings for more than a hundred of cases, which really shows that a huge uh, capacity of adaptation by uh, the um, highest court of the European Union. So I found this interesting to, to show today. Um, what is also interesting for us in terms of research is that since the beginning of the pandemic, we have access to data about virtual hearings due to empirical studies and uh, reports which were like uh, done by courts. So for example, the Arizona Supreme Court really analyzed um, all the practices related to virtual hearings by all the courts of Arizona. And it uh, gave us a lot of data about the use of virtual hearings and feedbacks from judges. And those kind of data are very interesting for us to analyze. I also wanted to mention the Law and Society uh, interactive map. So you can see here, for example, that all the uh, yellow points uh, represent the courts which were using virtual hearings uh, in June 2021. So, and I also wanted to um, mention the work of Richard Suskin in collaboration with UK courts, uh, which uh, is published on Remote Courts Worldwide website. And it really maps like all the virtual hearings and virtual experiences done by courts worldwide. So I think that we now have lots of interesting resources to analyze um, and further understand virtual hearings. So then I want to focus a bit on the Canadian experience of uh, virtual hearings. So in an article by uh, Pudister and Small, uh, we see that 90% of the Canadian courts they reviewed have heard matters deemed urgent via technology. So we can see that this number shows that there is a huge increase of um, technological enabled uh, trials during the pandemic in Canada. Um, also, there is this article by Hopkins and Urbas, uh, which really gather all the decisions which have been adopted by courts uh, since the beginning of the pandemic. And those decisions show that the Canadian judges are really supportive towards the use of uh, virtual hearings. So I took, for example, this decision in which the judges decided to reject the argument according to which virtual hearings were unconstitutional. And the judges say that virtual hearings allows uh, litigation to proceed effectively under controlled and safer conditions. So this is very like um, an approach that is utilitarist of the technology, but that is really reflected in all court decisions rendered by Canadian and courts. So there is also this decision in which the judge say it's 2020 and uh, he explains that we are concerned about virtual hearing but mostly because we are not familiar with the technology. And finally I quoted the uh, Mrs. Justice Callum MacLeod uh, who said that virtual hearings are likely to retain a permanent place in the, in the judicial toolbox. So finally, the third part uh, will focus on some answers I found in the literature to the question, what have we learned from this accelerated experience? So first, like the literature reflects that there are lots of issues related to the technology. The main issues, uh, the main issue is like the digital divide. So for example, in Canada, only 34% of rural households and 24% of indige indigenous communities have access to high-speed internet. So this kind of digital divide really um, is the, might threat the access to justice. And I think that this is uh, 
one of the main challenges uh, in the use of uh, virtual hearings today. Uh, also, issues related to privacy and cybersecurity were reflected in the literature. So lots of sources referred to the Zoom uh, flows security problem. Um, and we also had some sources that were referring to the lack of quality towards the video and video conferencing software. So this is something we might need to address. Um, also, the literature shows that rights and principles are affected by virtual hearings. So first, the due process and procedural fairness uh, takes a huge part of the literature, uh, especially regarding some rights, such as the right to a jury trial, the right to defend, and um, also there are lots of studies towards the efficiencies of uh, attorney's, uh, attorney's work uh, during virtual hearings. And um, also the, the principle that is uh, particularly affected by virtual hearings is open courts principle and public trials. But here I also wanted to show that the courts uh, managed to reply quickly to this challenge. So for example, the Canadian courts uh, allow, user, uh, allow individuals to register for online um, hearings through their website. So I think that this issue um, seems to be uh, quite like easy to solve in some extent. Uh, also, it's interesting to note that the literature uh, is focusing on the experience uh, which is affected by virtual hearings. So for example, there is this article by Bendes and Fagenson which focus on the experience of users, witnesses and litigants. Um, during virtual hearings, and they compare virtual hearings to physical one. And uh, so they, they show that virtual courts seem less authentic and legitimate than physical courtrooms. They also say that there is a lack of bodily co-presence, which is a very important con uh, concept um, in, um, in like, the literature related to courtrooms and virtual hearings. And um, also the literature shows that uh, virtual courts are depersonalized. Um, we can see a good point in virtual hearings is that litigants and witnesses usually feel less intimidated during virtual hearings. Uh, and finally, some pilot uh, experiences with um, like a hundred of participants show that virtual courts are overstimulating and tiresome for participants. Um, I also wanted to show uh, this uh, graph from the Civil Justice Council, uh, which shows that the majority of lawyers find virtual hearings worse than physical hearings. So I think that virtual hearings at this stage do not really compete with physical hearings. Um, and finally, there are lots of behavior behavioral studies about the perception and, uh, of uh, litigants and how it is affected by virtual hearings. So the article of Bundes and Fagetson shows that the interpretation of behavioral evidence is modified by, um, by virtual hearings. And uh, this is really um, like the area of study of uh, David Tate, Medebrit Rosners, uh, McCurdy and Tay. So I uh, quoted those uh, studies and articles which really focus on how when we are doing uh, virtual hearings or uh, perception is affected. So for example, they took picture of uh, virtual hearings and analyzed the way that participants uh, behavior or um, background, for example, could really um, impact the perception we have of them. And this really matters because like the uh, weight of behavior uh, is very important in trials. So this is something that should be uh, further analyzed. And there is this report uh, by uh, Tate and Tay from, from uh, 2019, which shows that uh, when during virtual hearings, like accused are uh, more badly perceived uh, by, uh, by the jury. So this is uh, also important data to analyze for the, the future of virtual hearings. And so I wanted to conclude uh, this presentation on the fact that virtual hearings might be uh, the new normal for courts uh, in the future, according to the literature. Uh, because for example, like as you can see um, by the uh, civil, 
with the Civil Justice Council report, uh, most of courts have a positive perception of virtual hearings after uh, having experienced uh, those during this, the pandemic. So you can see in yellow and blue that most of the courts found that uh, the experience, the overall experience was positive. And um, also there is a willingness um, to, to promote the use of virtual hearings and to improve virtual hearings because a lot of organizations and courts published a recommendation in the last two years. So you can see, for example, the recommendation by the uh, California Commission on Access to Justice and the best practices which have been published by Ontario courts. And uh, they really provide recommendations based on the, ex the experience they had. So among the most important recommendations, there is the, the thing that we need to decide which proceedings uh, to conduct remotely. Um, also, we need to select and implement an easy to use technology in order to like, enable lay users to really uh, use virtual hearings properly. We also need to pay a particular attention to the digital divide and to improve the design of virtual courtrooms. And finally, there is a lot of uh, literature on how we can provide information to users to improve their experience, and also how we need to train the court personnel also towards the interpretation and the perception of behavior uh, while uh, conducting virtual hearings. So I think this is all for me, and I would be happy to reply to your questions. I would like to thank you, uh, Aurore, for a very enlightening uh, overview of the literature. I think it was wonderful for all of us. Um, so I, I now turn to uh, the experience part of our workshop, and we start with, uh, with courts, the, the experience of courts. Uh, and we, we are fortunate enough to have Justice Thierry Nadon uh, with us to uh, to talk to us about the experience at the Cour du Québec. Thierry Nadon was uh, appointed uh, judge of the Cour du Québec in 2013. He sits in the uh, district uh, of Montreal. Uh, he does uh, criminal trials. Uh, he uh, has been active in the area of the integration of uh, technology and judicial services for uh, for some time. So uh, I'm, 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 I'm very pleased. Thank you for joining thank you. Me. Thank you. Good morning to all. Uh, thank you for uh, the invitation. Uh, first, I would like to say that the, the, the views that I will hold are, are very personal to me and they speak of my experience with the, uh, the use of technology in courtrooms. If you want to see what the uh, Courts Quebec has uh, put forward, there are documents on our website, the Courts Quebec website, for the orientation of the um, the use of technology in the courtroom. Uh, so you could, could look that up if you would, would want to read it. Um, I sit in criminal court, but I've also sat in youth court, so I have uh, experience, uh, different types of experience with dip different types of clientele. And what Madame Trussel was saying is, is a very, very good, uh, uh, I would say, um, representation of what's going on in our courtrooms. Uh, I'll talk first about criminal law, the criminal law aspect and how it's working and what needs to be improved. Uh, I'll touch upon youth court after and uh, I'll, I'll give uh, afterwards my, uh, my my five cents or my two cents about what we should improve and what we should keep and, and et cetera, et cetera. In criminal law in Canada, we have to say that it, uh, the norm is that trials and the, the hearings are conducted in person. That's what the, the criminal code says. That said, because we live in the different times, we've had to adapt and the criminal code now permits uh, virtual hearings of just about anything from the appearance of the accused up to the sentence of the accused. So, and we've used it quite uh, profusely. Uh, there are a lot of uh, hearings now that are conducted virtually because in a criminal law setting, for example, there's a lot of urgent matters. People are arrested, people are detained, uh, people uh, were uh, assaulted, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, it needs to go on, the court system needs to still function and could not stop. So we've had to adapt. 
I have to say that um, just last week I've conducted a, a trial where it was uh, part in presence and part virtual. So the first day was in presence, the second day was virtual. So I think the, the, what, what the motto is, is we have to adapt. We've had to adapt more than we have, but we've had and we have to adapt. Uh, there are advantages, I would say, to virtual uh, hearings. The first is uh, some are efficient. I'll give the example of appearances of accused. For example, if someone is arrested and needs to appear before a judge within 24 hours, there's no doubt that it's efficient. The people appear uh, from police stations or from jail and it's more efficient than bringing people to courtrooms and to courthouses, which was done before. That's, that's without saying uh, it's more efficient. It's also less costly for, for some of the uh, hearings. For example, the same thing for appearances, not to bring accused in the courtroom or in the courthouse and just having them appear via visio conference or uh, in the courts Quebec, we use the team platform. Another advantage is, and that goes without saying, that we can do the hearing from just about anywhere. So these would be the advantages. The disadvantages or the things to improve upon, and Madame Troussel touched upon that with the literature. Uh, as I was saying, there's advantages as being efficient, but there are disadvantages to being this efficient. Uh, and I'll explain myself. Uh, we've had, we have in courts and in criminal courts, um, people with mental health uh, issues. And that is something that most of the time is not uh, the ideal situation to have a hearing uh, on a platform. That that's, goes without saying. There's also the first timers, for, as I would uh, phrase, or I, was, uh, I would... Uh, say in a criminal court, the, the, the person who's arrested and comes to criminal court for the first time and appears on a platform, I would say is not the ideal way of doing it. Uh, that's the same thing. The third disadvantage of being efficient, but maybe too efficient, is that we have to take the time to do uh, the hearing. And when we do it in a platform, and I, I guess it's human nature, we try to be too efficient and uh, maybe things are rushed in a way that they would not be uh, inside a courtroom because of the decorum and because of the setting of a courtroom. So that's, that's something that we have to think about. Uh, they're also effective but not effective. I, I'll give a, a very practical example. In Montreal, we have a lot of cases where we need, we need interpreters for different types of languages. And that, that is a that is something that, that is efficient, but not efficient on a platform. How do you record the translation? How do you record, how do you get the translation to the person who's on the platform? So these are, this is a practical question that leads to it's efficient, but there are issues with efficiency. The, uh, where the hearing takes place is another issue. And I, I'll, give a, it's a, I'll give an example. Uh, sometimes we have to conduct trials where people are in jail and it's not an ideal place to conduct your trial. I mean, for a person who's facing the criminal justice system, it's, it's something that's, that's difficult. It's something that's stressful. And with the COVID, we've had some accused who've, who've had their trials from the, the jail uh, via visio conference, and that is less than ideal. And uh, uh, so this is something that... Uh, of course, we need to do because it's urgent and the matter is urgent, but it's not, uh, I would say, um, the ideal situation for an accused and for everybody involved. I've heard Madame Tercel talk about lawyers, and I, I think that lawyers should be consulted on uh, the use of that. I know I'm, I'm consulted here as a judge, but I remember my time as a prosecutor and I was doing jury trials. Uh, I hear what Madame Troussel was saying. As a lawyer, you need to feel the courtroom. You need to feel the witnesses. You need to have a rapport with the witness. You need to have to see the decider, how the decider is, is, um, is reacting. Uh, being a lawyer is part, and it's a large part, of the human aspect. 
So that's what I, I think lawyers should be uh, consulted uh, to see their experience. Because it's one thing to argue in law, to have legal questions to be argued. That, that's fine. You can do it with, with teams. But when you do a jury trial, for example, or even a criminal law trial or a youth court uh, hearing, there's this feel of the courtroom and lawyers are, it's their job. And that's, and it's a very important human rapport that they have to have. And I think lawyers need to be consulted more on that to see what their experience is. Um, maybe also to touch upon the depends on the nature. Uh, as I was sitting in youth court last year, uh, just to, for, for the audience in Quebec, youth court deals with uh, uh, youth offenders and also, but mostly with protection of kids who, whose security and development are, are, are in danger. And we've had to adapt because of the pandemic and because of the urgency of the matters, but doing a protection hearing on the phone or on a platform, a Teams platform, for example, is, is and I'll put it mildly, is less than ideal. Uh, when you have a mother or a father who's, who's ha who has problems and who appears before you from his living room and that uh, the court will maybe eventually uh, have to, 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 to protect the, the children and, and order things about his or her children, it's less than ideal to do that on a platform. And that goes back to the sanctity of the courtroom, the, the presence in the courtroom and the, the setting that makes it more, um, well, the age old uh, practice of having people in the courtroom. So that's, that's a thing to look at. So depending on the hearing, I think that some are more conducive to virtual hearings, some are not. And some we do them because we have to, uh, because of, of the times we live in. So all this to say that uh, I think Chief Justice Vagnaya was mentioning it, mentioning it in, a, in a conference yesterday, and I, it's, it was published in the paper this morning, that we have to modernize the justice system, and it goes without saying. Uh, and I think that virtual hearing are here to stay. But... Uh, they're not, and I would say in French, there's a word that say c'est pas la panacée, meaning that it's not the end all, uh, end all, uh, or how could I say it? It's not the um, what we should strive for in every cases. It's something that we should use. It's something that we should improve, and that we can improve, and that we can use and should use. But in some matters, uh, what we've done for hundreds of years in courtrooms should remain in courtrooms. So basically that's, that's what uh, my five cents or two cents about uh, uh, the uh, virtual hearing. Thank, thank you very much. That, that was very, uh, very enlightening and, 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 and very uh, convincing, I have to say. <laughs> now this is the time to move to uh, our experience with administrative tribunals and so I move to uh, our guest Joshua Prowse. He's the director of program management and the refugee protection division of the Immigration and Refugee Board of Canada and one of his uh, responsibilities uh, is to oversee the division's virtual hearing uh, model. Uh, Joshua is a lawyer, he's uh, presided over hundreds of refugee hearings involving claimants from more than uh, 60 different countries. So that's certainly an aspect uh, which, uh, which is interesting in this, uh, in this context. So I turn it over to uh, Joshua, thinking, uh, th thanking you for uh, joining us. Okay, uh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to uh, be with you today. I wanted to, basically walk through a little bit of where we came from as a tribunal uh, with virtual hearings, and then uh, go to talking about some of the main 
uh, features or aspects of the virtual hearing model that uh, we have implemented at the Immigration and Refugee Board. So just to start off then uh, with our virtual hearing model, virtual hearings as we conceive of them are hearings that take place where somebody is connecting to the hearing using a private device. I And I provide this definition to contrast it with something that we've done for years prior, which was having video conference hearings between uh, different offices at the Immigration and Refugee Board of Canada. And so we've been doing that since the 1990s. Uh, we would have somebody come into one of our offices or use court space in a province and often have them connect to a decision maker that was located elsewhere. What really changed when it came to the virtual hearings that we launched uh, was that we started having people using their personal devices to connect to the uh, hearings. So if we just go to the next slide, uh, then uh, what just providing a little bit of context about the Immigration and Refugee Board. Uh, this is the largest independent administrative tribunal in Canada. We have four different divisions or essentially many tribunals, and I'm speaking about one of them, uh, specifically the Refugee Protection Division. And this is the first level tribunal for individuals in Canada uh, who file a refugee claim and want their claim for asylum to be heard. They can then proceed to the Immigration Appeal Division if they or the government appeals a decision. And we also have two other tribunals, our Immigration Division, which deals with matters like detention of individuals and our Immigration Appeal Division, which deals with matters including uh, spousal sponsorships and whether marriages are genuine, uh, certain aspects of criminality, and whether people uh, can remain in Canada. And so this just provides uh, some context for the tribunal. And I note that because the Immigration Division's work is urgent. They're dealing with reviews of individuals who are involuntarily detained. And uh, the Immigration Division continued their work immediately after the pandemic using uh, telephone services. In, in contrast with the Refugee Protection Division, our view has been that we wanted to have video conferencing for almost all of these hearings that we do. And as a result, we took more time after the start of the pandemic to be able to launch a process for doing these hearings uh, with full video conference using the Microsoft Teams platform. And the Refugee Protection Division Ultimately, our mission is both to try and assess uh, refugee claims, to find the refugees and offer them protection, to provide a welcome to refugees to Canada, while also providing expeditious decisions uh, which uh, provide answers to those who are not being accepted for refugee protection so that they can continue with their lives. And at this point, uh, we have an inventory of about 60,000 refugee claims. We, at the Refugee Protection Division, uh, deal with uh, approximately 50,000 refugee claims each year. 
we can go to the next slide. Just to provide a little bit more context, uh, where in a refugee proceeding, you have the board member, uh, the individual or family that is applying for protection. In about 90% of cases, they have uh, counsel, and lawyer or immigration consultant, and uh, that's usually uh, provided by legal aid. And then in the vast majority of cases, there is also an interpreter at the proceeding. And then the government can partake in any hearing, um, having minister's counsel appear in order to contest a claim, although that happens in a minority of cases. In the most cases, this is an inquisitorial process looking at what uh, the merits of the claim are. And so if we go to the next slide, then I I alluded to how we have these policies on uh, video conference hearings, and this one dates from 2004, and we were doing video conference hearings between our offices uh, in the 1990s. But as we see on the next slide, what we did when we wanted to start the uh, virtual pr proceedings was we were really able to start by reaching out and working with a number of stakeholders that support the refugee determination system. And they provided in the early months after the start of the pandemic, significant feedback that came to us about our virtual proceedings and the shape that those should take. And if we go to the next slide, what we see and what we what we implemented uh, starting in July of 2020 uh, was we worked with Microsoft to deploy a secure version of Microsoft Teams that stored its data in Canada. And we thought a lot about security in the context of these hearings, how we can provide plain language information to those who are participating in these hearings, how security should work in a context where we're dealing with witnesses overseas, uh, connecting to hearings, either using the same software or on a telephone, and uh, issues like the location of interpreters, and the members where that's required to be in Canada generally, um, or the location of council where there's actually been more flexibility to have council connecting to hearings from other countries provided that they are licensed to practice here in Canada. We created other materials, a guide with best practices that we provide to parties and at the beginning of each hearing, we have registry staff greet the participants, check their audio and video. And we've heard some discussion about efficiency uh, earlier today in the context of these virtual hearings. And for us, this is new, having registry staff spend time to check the audio and video of every single hearing that we do is actually quite time consuming. And when we look at the virtual hearings as a whole that the Refugee Protection Division is doing, these have not been an efficiency tool. They've been a tool to continue operations in the context of the pandemic, um, but they've actually been quite time consuming. We've tried to design more lean process improvements that are being implemented over time to improve some of that efficiency. Another thing that we do is we work in conjunction with non-governmental organizations across Canada in order to do what we call ready tours. We have launched virtual ready tours where claimants come to one of these tours about a week or so before their hearing, and it provides them with information about what to expect on the day of the hearing. They get to ask questions that they have, and 
because it uses the same software, it's also an opportunity for them to test out their connection in advance of their proceeding. We see on the next slide some of what we looked at in terms of um, technology. We we redesigned our forms that we send out in advance of the hearing to try and provide plain language, graphical content that is accessible to those uh, with uh, the profile of those who are appearing before us. And the Government of Canada has a set of cyber safe recommendations, and we really built upon those in order to identify what the best practices are related to security in situations where some claimants are fleeing uh, governments that are known to engage in cyber espionage and other security issues. And so we spend a lot of time thinking that through. And on the next slide, some of how we implemented that um, is that we also provide options for claimants to come to our offices in order to do their hearings. We set up government computers that are completely um, secure, meeting the standards that we have, and we make those available where there's a good reason why somebody cannot proceed remotely in the context of the pandemic. And one of the other things that we did from the start of these proceedings was we launched these virtual hearings in the summer of 2020 as a pilot project. And we wanted to learn from that. So after each hearing that we did, we would send out uh, by email a survey to the uh, participants to ask about their experience and to ask about uh, their suggestions. And this is something that we have continued since um, sending out tens of thousands of invitations to participate in these surveys. And it's something that we worked on more broadly about the evaluation of these virtual hearings. We uh, partnered with a number of independent actors, including uh, cyber justice in Montreal, including uh, independent academics who uh, came and worked with us on surveys, on focus groups, on other questionnaires going out to key stakeholders in order to learn from the experience of those who are appearing before the board. Uh, part of what cyber justice worked on was a set of questions that uh, we call a sense of access to justice, um, a set of questions to see whether the perceived sense of access to justice is similar between these virtual proceedings and the proceedings that were taking place from our offices. And when we looked at that, um, for example, looked at questions uh, asking whether the fact that the hearing was virtual made it more or less stressful. About 80% of claimants indicated that the hearing was less stressful uh, for them. And that's something that's important for us. And that's an important part of access to justice as we conceive of it in this context. The next slide highlights some of the challenges that we tried to respond to. I talked about some of the computers that we made available at our offices across Canada. We tried to have clear information on our website in, on, in our guide about how individuals can opt out of uh, virtual hearings and the, the ready tours that we would not be able to do if not for the NGOs that we participate in offering those hearings with. And on the next slide, one of the other key things that we did was work on trying to have clear and plain language communications uh, for those who are taking part in these hearings. And so this provides an indication that um, this is something we send out by email in advance of each hearing. Uh, 
where we have like five key uh, tips to make them work better. And that's based on data where we've looked at what are the uh, key issues that can arise in these hearings. And we try and design interventions like this and others in order to make the hearings work better and then see how those are working. And on the next slide, Another key part of this has been about being able to get access to information. When the pandemic started, the Refugee Protection Division was primarily a paper-based organization. Afterwards, we launched a process to digitize our files. We digitized paper files for uh, uh, more than 50,000 uh, refugee claims in our inventory, and that's had significant implications for us. We can now move files around the country to a greater degree. For example, if a decision maker a member in Montreal is sick in the morning, we can potentially transfer that file to a member in Calgary to step in if they can get up to speed on the file. Uh, but we also have this screenshot on screen from our portal that we call My Case, which we launched on our website. This is something that uh, council can log into in order to provide disclosure on a case. Uh, as a government entity for various security reasons, we had never actually made it possible to email us disclosure prior to this. And that's something that we changed at the beginning of the pandemic. And so that's another uh, way that the pandemic operated as something of a disruptive force to be able to change practices. Turning then to uh, this uh, slide, this is looking at our quality assurance framework. And this is another way that we have evaluated how we're doing with these virtual hearings. Uh, one part of this is something that we call our quality measurement initiative, where we it's a very simple idea. We've been able to agree upon concrete indicators of quality, and then we measure them year over year. We I invite an academic to observe a certain number of proceedings, read decisions, and then let us know how we are doing with having decisions that are plain language, that are easy to read, that and proceedings that are fair. And so this is something where we have brought in those academics. We provided uh, specific and different questions that related to the virtual hearing environment. And then uh, we're able to see here are areas that we're doing well. Here are areas where we can focus on improvement uh, and how the virtual hearing environment has changed that. And so that's that's another piece of what we are doing. And so uh, thank you, Dominique. The, that's the last slide in the presentation, and I just thought I would close by uh, noting that another piece of what we've done is we record the videos for the hearings that we do. We've recorded tens of thousands of hearing videos, and that's something we can also go back and look at in order to ask questions and review these videos to see how is the video quality for these different members? How well, are, are people using the virtual backgrounds? Are interpreters using the background that we provided uh, for them? And ask other questions like that. And then we also, as part of rolling these out, thought about questions like credibility of proceedings and our requirement to be reasonable with our credibility determinations. We brought in academics and did specific training on credibility assessment in a virtual environment. And that's a lot about how this has been implemented thus far. And we are doing a lot of thinking about how this will evolve into the future. Maybe people have been 
more comfortable with the virtual proceedings and felt more sense of safety doing them in part because of the pandemic. And we're thinking how this will change in the months and years to come. And we're also trying to respond to a number of the technological challenges to integrate this with some of our legacy video conferencing systems at our offices to improve issues like simultaneous interpretation or better sharing of documents during hearings. And as we think about the way that this will evolve in the future months. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. This is uh, th this was this was wonderful. Thank you very much for uh, enlightening us. Uh, on the, uh, the extensive uh, practice uh, of, the, of the board. Uh, so we, we're out of time for this segment, and so we'll move to the arbitration segment, the last of our uh, experience uh, uh, segment of the, uh, of, of the workshop. And we uh, have the pleasure of having Stephanie Cohen, who's uh, a full-time uh, arbitrator. She happens to be Canadian, but she's based in New York City and works out of uh, New York. She's an international arbitrator, a well-known international arbitrator. She's uh, known internationally for her work on cybersecurity and uh, on leveraging technology in the arbitration process. This is international work. Um, she's held leading roles with uh, the New York Bar and the CPR uh, on this issue, and recently she's chaired the ICC Commission Working Group on Information Technology in International Arbitration. The uh, report uh, of that working group is going to be published in a, a week or so, or maybe two weeks, a week, I think, uh, from now. Uh, maybe, maybe we'll, we'll, we'll learn some, uh, some, some bits uh, from, from that report. Uh, Stephanie will share uh, her own experience as well as what, she, what she's uh, learned uh, from sharing that uh, report. Uh, the uh, ICC Commission has the advantage of uh, access uh, to a huge pool of practitioners internationally uh, and so gets uh, a vast amount of information on, on practices and experience in this area. Over to you, Stephanie. Thank you, Fabien. And, and I must say, uh, this has been really a particular pleasure to listen to everyone this morning, to get outside of uh, my world and to hear both the parallels and the differences um, in, in other fora. And so I hope we'll have a, ch a chance to sort of highlight some of those as, uh, as I talk about what the experience with international commercial arbitration is. And I emphasize the word commercial because I think that's one of the things that uh, makes a difference in our experience to um, the experiences that we've just heard about. So um, I'm gonna talk about what has facilitated our trans, what facilitated the transition to virtual hearings in the arbitration context. And then I want to turn, uh, of course, to these questions about what the broader effect on the process has been, both two years into the pandemic and then you know, what that means for the post-pandemic world. Um, we've all talked about the rapid transition to remote evidentiary hearings. I think in the arbitration context, rapid almost understates that when we're talking about what happened with courts versus arbitration, because it wasn't the summer of 2020 that we saw this transition, but late winter, uh, early spring, that when uh, orders came down telling people that they had to return to their homes and they were mid-hearing, a few days later, they were back online to continue the hearing. So this really was a rapid transition uh, to a, a completely new environment. And I think there are four factors that have really contributed to that. The first is that by its nature, arbitration is a flexible process and there's a high degree of emphasis on, on party autonomy. Um, so we're guided very often by a set of arbitration rules but there's broad discretion that's given to the arbitrator in order to determine how the proceedings unfold. And there really is this emphasis on parties having input and being in control of the process. So, you know, Joshua was talking about how uh, claimant choice is important in the immigration context, party autonomy and tribunal authority go hand in hand as the sort of two pillars of, of the arbitration process. So that really meant that 
parties made active choices when confronted with the pandemic to move to the online environment and to do that rapidly. Part of that was aided by the fact that the taking of evidence in international arbitration is, is really a hybrid procedure between the common law and civil law traditions. The practice has evolved to the point where parties are expected to present their cases in writing in full before you ever get to the evidentiary hearing. So that means that in, in my practice, hearings for even highly complex, high value disputes tend to be significantly shorter than they would than uh, a courtroom trial in Ontario, for example. The focus is, of course, on cross-examination as well as opening and closing statements. But that means we're also not necessarily looking to shift a six-week trial online. Uh, a two-week hearing in an international arbitration, even for a highly complex matter, I would say is not the norm. We're usually looking at things significantly shorter. So you're talking about a maximum of a two week hearing in more instances that you're trying to have online. And that greatly, I think, facilitated, um, facilitated the process. We certainly had conversations in the early days of the pandemic about issues like credibility and, and what matters. You know, can I, can I effectively evaluate evidence? And we got a lot of great jokes, I think, out, out of that. Like, if you can't see the whites of witnesses' eyes, then you need to get a bigger screen. And so there's some element of uh, dismissiveness at the outset, I would say, of the pandemic of some of those concerns, because the focus at that time is really not should I have a hearing online, but can I have a hearing uh, online? So when there were objections by one party and there wasn't common agreement to shift online, the balancing exercise really largely tips in favor in a pandemic towards converting, converting the process. So those lingering questions about credibility get put aside. You don't wanna let the perfect be the enemy of the good, it's good enough. And some of that comes from a perception that evaluations of credibility, for example, are less important in a commercial context or have a different meaning in a commercial context than they do in others. Because a case has been presented in full in writing in, in international arbitration, a lot of what's being evaluated by the decision makers are the documents, the documents that are relied upon, the transaction, uh, you know, what took place in, in a commercial matter, the language of the contract, not as much as likely to turn on the testimony of one or two witnesses. So we speak about credibility, uh, but the reality is that credibility is judged not just with reference to the demeanor that we see when someone appears before us, but really the full context of what has been presented and documents make a big difference uh, to the commercial arbitrator in those, in those assessments. But the shift is still an important departure from normal practice um, because the, the, the presumption has always been in international arbitration that you have an in-person hearing. And in fact, if you fail to appear in person, then the tribunal would have the authority to disregard a written witness statement that was presented uh, in advance in its discretion. So while we certainly had applications in exceptional cases that would be made to a tribunal to hear a witness by remote means over Skype, uh, for example, is really saved for those exceptional circumstances where there would be an illness or an inability to travel, less commonly for reasons of time and, 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 and convenience. Uh, and even in the international context, that would mean that someone might appear to be cross-examined for an hour or even a less than an hour, but have to travel literally across the globe to attend the hearing for that cross-examination. And I think Aurora's presentation really flags some reasons why that is. It's because video conferencing traditionally required expensive and dedicated equipment. And so the second uh, factor that I would highlight in, in, in enabling us to tran transition so quickly and rapidly online is that desktop video conferencing is so different than the video conferencing that we as practitioners had experienced throughout, uh, throughout practice. And so that means a lot of the hesitancy that existed before uh, really disappeared. Highly convenient and user-friendly technology has really been critical to the transition online. And in fact, there have been a number of practitioner surveys uh, throughout the course of, of the pandemic. And as uh, Fabien mentioned, 
I've been involved with one project where we did a survey of 500 arbitration practitioners from around the globe. And I would say the factors highlighted most frequently in terms of satisfaction with, with the process and willingness to engage further have been the convenience and user friendliness. And although we're in a form where privacy and confidentiality are hugely important, very often convenience and ease of use are put ahead of those, those factors. Um, people want something that is easier to, to use. The third factor that really aided the transition is that guidance for the conduct of remote uh, pro hearings really exploded in two, different, in two different forms. And it's because the community, the international arbitration community, uh, really is um, highly communicative and, and close-knit is that something being developed by someone in Canada um, found its way across the globe to someone in Sydney, Australia. And we really saw a brain trust, I think, develop where we're picking from ideas from different people, similarities building on court practices and local experiences to converge into what has become you know, recommended best practices for the conduct of remote uh, hearings. And so the practical experience is really something where we've seen a significant amount of, of attention. And I, I could spend more than 20 minutes going through um, all of those sort of practical uh, elements. Um, but what I'll do is I'll highlight a couple of uh, points that emerge from, from the practical guidance that I think are important. So of course, earliest in the pandemic, the recommendations did focus on the traditional video conferencing. We saw recommendations that said you should agree on minimum equipment standards, right? You know, thinking about the, the cameras that you roll in and the screens, and that has no place whatsoever um, when we're all using Zoom um, from, from our living rooms. And so where we evolved then is to, to models for desktop uh, video conferencing. First and foremost, I, I think that the pr procedures focus on ensuring that there would be same, the same or equivalent procedural fairness. And one of the, the most important uh, things that evolved in that context is this idea of advanced technical testing. Now, there's something similar to that in what uh, Joshua was speaking about um, in, in making sure that, that everyone is familiar with the technology, but that really has become something that is de rigueur in uh, proceedings is that there's a, an advanced technical test involving all of the participants that may be done asynchronously. It doesn't mean we all have to be at the same time. The tribunal has to be satisfied that people have access to the equipment, that they're familiar with the technology, and it's really significant effort put on making sure that there won't be technical disruptions during the proceeding, that people are aware of lighting issues, of audio issues, that we have backup measures in place in case there are disruptions. And so getting rid of as much as possible the technical issues, really a huge uh, focus of the procedures. Integrity of the witness evidence is another uh, area, making sure that there would be no one else in the room. Sometimes we've seen um, suggestions that the tribunal might make use of a 360 degree camera to be able to view and make sure that there's no one else in the room. I'd say that that kind of measure has largely been viewed uh, more as in, in the extreme, that there's some recognition that, that there's always a risk um, of, of witness, um, uh, I don't want to say tampering, but of influencing witness when a witness has a break, for example, or so on. So I think some of the concern about that has, um, has lowered uh, in temperature throughout the course of the proceedings, as people realize this generally is not something that we need to be um, really quite quite concerned about. We're attentive to it. We want to make sure there's formality. We uh, sometimes issue longer oaths now or affirmations to witnesses before they testify to ensure that uh, if Fabien were testifying, for example, he might be asked to expressly confirm for the record that there is no one else present present, that he understands he is not to have anything else open on his device, that he turns off his cell phone. So really quite high attention to, uh, to those issues. Decorum and setup, uh, council etiquette, who should appear on the camera um, at one time and not use you know, virtual backgrounds, for example, in order again to be able to ensure who, who is there. 
Um, and then the other aspect of, of the practical guidance has really focused moving away from what the sort of minimum standards have to be to some of the experiential issues. What can we do to experience, uh, improve the experience? So having frequent breaks, um, you know, for, for example, really is a difference between what we do in person and how we conduct the uh, proceeding online. In parallel to the practical guidance, there was significant guidance that emerged on the legal side. Uh, concerted attention and analysis of arbitrator authority and the ultimate enforceability of an award in the particular case where someone objects to proceeding online. So I, I started at the outset with an, with an assumption that everybody was willing to go online. And in, in the majority of cases, really, we did see that transition. There was, at, at times, we had some parties deciding that they wanted to postpone uh, to see if the situation improved. And so we did have a certain segment of cases that really shifted ahead a couple of months. Most of those cases, almost all of those cases have gone on, gone online that any initial objections um, that existed certainly got eased as there was more comfort with the technology. But there are some instances where tribunals were called upon to rule uh, on an objection. And so in that instance, we really got um, a lot of insight about how courts across the world are treating these issues and what the what the national law any mandatory national law is on authority to um, to decide now since the the pandemic has gone forward there's very few court cases that I am aware of where there has actually been a challenge after the issuance of an award uh, because an arbitrator or a tribunal proceeded to hold a hearing um, but in Austria and Switzerland, I'm aware of decisions there that have upheld um, the tribunal's decision to hold a hearing over an objection of a, of a party. Uh, and so what we saw was the development of um, an analysis of the rules on, on the kinds of factors that should be considered in making a determination about whether the authority actually exists, which really requires a fairly detailed analysis of the applicable arbitration rules, as well as the national laws that might be applicable um, to ensure whether an award is enforceable. Now, things that favor the tribunal's authority include general discretion over procedure. Uh, many arbitration rules would expressly mention the use of technology to be able to increase efficiency and economy, or uh, have rules that refer to a duty to avoid unnecessarily delay and expense, as well as rules emphasizing tribunal authority to determine how witnesses are examined and who shall be present during witness examination. In the context of the pandemic, the reason for ordering a remote hearing, I think, became very important. Now, Aurora, you pointed out uh, some court decisions at the outset. Um, the It's 2020 case from, from Alberta is one that, that circulated widely throughout the arbitration community. One of the other decisions that circulated widely was a decision, um, CAPIC, from Australia. And in that instance, the thing that I would highlight is that the, the court went through quite a detailed analysis of all the different complaints that we might have about procedure and ways in which to mitigate the risks that can arise. And it's really a very fulsome discussion. But at the outset, the court's language is focused on but for. But for the pandemic, I would not have this six-week trial online. And so it really raises an interesting question that a lot of our ability to move online in instances where there's been concern or an objection has been driven by comfort taken from court saying, this is okay because of the extreme circumstances that exist. So I think in arbitration, we've been able to get beyond concerns about technical issues um, by, by taking steps to mitigate the process and, and ensure a, a sort of a minimum level of fairness. I, I think we've also been able to move forward because we have comfort that courts will enforce decisions made in the context of the pandemic. I don't think we have fully confronted those issues if the pandemic isn't there and someone objects. You know, what does that mean? So let's move to another thing that's developed out of the uh, pandemic, and that is a real effort to remove the obstacles that might exist to tribunals being able to exercise maximum discretion to determine what's most appropriate in individual circumstances of the case. So we have seen an evolution in arbitration rules to give express 
authority to arbitrators to order or determine what makes sense. Should it be in person? Should it be virtual? Should it be hybrid? And we don't refer to virtual as much. We refer to remote hearings that could be through other technology, technology that doesn't exist yet. So in theory, there is a change as we move out of the pandemic, but there's no longer a presumption necessarily in favor of in-person hearings. And in the arbitration context, because most national arbitration laws will recognize arbitrator authority when there's been agreement by the parties, and this is incorporated in arbitration rules, that will give us the ability to move forward. It will be rare instances where there's mandatory national law that says, despite what the parties have agreed, it is not appropriate to have, you cannot have a hearing uh, virtually if one party objects, that that would present an obstacle to us moving forward. Another thing that has popped up that greatly heard that facilitated our transition is the development of a concierge industry to facilitate uh, these hearings. Um, and, and there's a great Canadian example of this arbitration place out of Toronto uh, and Ottawa uh, went from having been a place just for physical hearings to really embracing virtual hearings and became known internationally uh, and really was getting a lot of the business internationally to be able to facilitate the hearings. And that has been um, something that has enabled arbitrators to uh, and counsel to have to focus less on the process issues and all of the different mechanical and logistical issues that go into organizing a virtual hearing, which are, which are vast. Um, and to also ensure that we can address some elements of, of the digital divide. Um, there were questions about differences between rural and urban access. Even in urban environments, there can be differences. People are not on wired connections, but they're on wireless connections. There's also, even if you don't have, it's not an issue of the minimum kind of experience, but, but maximizing and optimizing the hearing experience. This sort of concierge industry has been critical to that. They can send out suitcases of equipment so that if someone testifying doesn't have two screens or counsel doesn't have a, you know, the headset, the two screens, all of the things that you would like to make it better, they can send that to you. And they take care of walking people uh, through the process, doing all of the things that, um, that the immigration board is having, has to have their, their own sort of secretariat deal with as Joshua was mentioning. And I think in the international context, uh, one of the things that we've learned um, is that more of those kinds of services may be critical to us being able to move forward because where there are areas where there's uneven internet access and poor technology, if we have a development of regional hearing centers, where uh, even if that, that means that we're not convening physically in the same location for a hearing, but we're able to have local centers, then that may maximize our ability to ensure that people across the globe um, are able to do this. And I think I'm I'm probably getting close on time. So why don't I hit hit the sort of last element as Fabia gives me a good nod, um, which is a, a recognition that the sorry in a minute yes <laughs> okay a recognition that the moment isn't limited to remote hearings and so Fabia mentioned at the outset um, this report from the ICC Commission that I've been involved in and really through the pandemic we have moved then to focusing on technology tools that have been underutilized generally uh, in the arbitration process. So not just looking at uh, virtual hearings and really seizing the moment to take advantage of a willingness to deviate from old norms like paperlet, you know, uh, always having hard copies of, of filings, making use of case management platforms. So things that go far beyond the, the virtual hearing um, context and then how can we streamline and again greater focus on the optimization of the experience and so there's a number of checklists and tools um, that are that will be coming out in this uh, report to be launched on February 18th that touch on some of the things we haven't touched on earlier in the pandemic like what should you do when you're choosing a third party a service provider how can we streamline witness preparation uh, for a virtual hearing and what kind of model procedural order should we have so this kind of brings us to the ending point, which is as we move, as we transition throughout this, we get to a place where we're starting to think about some of these questions in a post-pandemic context. And I think arbitration has really um, been making, the community has been making a real effort to ensure that this isn't just a pandemic tool, but it is something that we can use forward. We've seen an evolution in, in rules and in practice 
We're going to confront new questions as we go forward. We have to confront the question about should I order a hearing if there's an objection, and that is a, is a different issue than has arisen in the pandemic. And we have to confront things like hybrid hearings, which are more likely to, to arise. So not just everybody online or everybody in person, but where people are potentially gathering in different locations. Thank, thank you very much, Stephanie. This, this was very, very enlightening. Um, so in the, in the interest of time, uh, I, I think I'll uh, just hop over the, uh, the, the questions for now. Uh, we may have an opportunity uh, later to put questions to uh, Stephanie. Uh, I'm, uh, I realize that this uh, leaves Jean Piero uh, exactly uh, zero seconds to prepare his, uh, his comments. Uh, are, are you ready to go, Jean Piero? You would like us to uh, entertain a few questions beforehand. Uh, sure, as you wish, I can I can go on very rapidly. I hope I don't have just zero seconds, but some minutes. No, no, okay no, no, no. <laughs> I need to prepare your uh, your comment. Ah, okay, okay, no, 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 no. Don't worry, I already prepared. It's okay. So please, please go ahead then. Okay, uh, how, how many minutes uh, do, you, do I have? You have all the time that you were given. Fifteen minutes. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, I, I would like to start uh, by thanking all the presenters for the very, very interesting uh, presentations. Uh, I, by hearing your, uh, your speeches, uh, I, I was, um, it came to my mind what uh, Richard Soskin was saying like in, in uh, 2019, uh, when he talked about uh, the evolution of the uh, justice system towards the, uh, a massive use of uh, technology in order to have uh, something like online courts and uh, in order to uh, improve in some way access to justice. But then we had the pandemic in 2020, and I guess this uh, uh, represented for many countries as also, or, or, or um, as explained to us, uh, a huge pilot uh, uh, regarding the uh, use of uh, uh, different kinds of technologies uh, in, uh, in, uh, in justice. I, I wanted just to bring, before uh, asking my question, I wanted just to bring here uh, the, the, um, the case of Italy, uh, where uh, after, uh, let's say, the first months of pandemic uh, started very rapidly to, um, um, to uh, push for uh, the use of virtual readings uh, in uh, many uh, kind of procedures from uh, uh, criminal to uh, civil, uh, civil to administrative procedures and also to uh, expand the use of, uh, let's say, online filing or the use of e-filing for uh, many of these proceedings. And uh, I think as uh, we discussed today that uh, this massive use of technology, as I said, represent a sort of, represented a sort of pilot uh, where we can uh, experience uh, how uh, this uh, technology may uh, impact on several aspects uh, regarding uh, the uh, functioning of justice system, not, not only on the, on the, uh, on the, uh, let's say on the efficiency side which is of course as Fabiana said an instrumental value but more on the, the real impact of on a principle related to rule of law and for instance in Italy we had some let's say a debate regarding which kind of technology has been used for virtual leaderings for instance there has been the, the request of using uh, Microsoft team uh, um, instruments, uh, which is, of course, a private company, which has a server based in another country, uh, in a non-European country, so they don't have to um, uh, comply with the, G the uh, GDPR uh, regulations. So there are, of course, uh, possible uh, problems uh, related to privacy and protection of sensitive, sensitive data. And uh, another question uh, was related to how these uh, um, technologies uh, were regulated. As uh, I heard today, uh, I totally agree that we had a very rapid transition and uh, government said to, uh, let's say, um, balance uh, the constitutional right for uh, the protection of all, of health, 
of health uh, with uh, the uh, the principle of access to justice and then they had to in some way regulate the use of uh, technology in different situations and uh, what they did they use a law degree um, which are of course drafted by governments but which has a, a huge impact on uh, on uh, um, constitutional rights uh, we look, uh, for instance, uh, it comes to my mind also the question of transparency and uh, access uh, to uh, information regarding uh, justice procedures, uh, which is a, 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 an issue that, that has been addressed by some of, uh, I think, by all of the presenters today. And uh, in Italy, for instance, we had a, a huge fragmentation of norms uh, regulating this kind of aspects uh, and which were also integrated uh, as I think it happened also in Canada and in other uh, contests by protocols uh, regarding the uh, uh, regarding the dis discipline of uh, virtual readings, which were prepared by uh, Council of the Judiciary, uh, at least in Italy and the Bar, Bar Association. Um, we also address the issue of access to justice. For me, uh, it is important to, and I want also to discuss it with the presenters, to think about this principle not as a, a, an absolute value. I think uh, we have to consider uh, uh, how different factors may affect uh, the uh, access to justice of actors. For instance, we talk about uh, the technological literacy, the educational level, the uh, access to uh, infrastructure, to technological infrastructure. And for lay user, for instance, the, uh, um, the legal knowledge and also how much they have um, possibility to have access to um, legal information in a plain language. This is something that has been address, addressed by uh, Joshua. I think this is a very interesting the work that has been done by uh, the Immigration Board of Canada. And uh, I think uh, another, another aspect that we should take into account is also uh, the accountability aspect. Uh, we uh, talked about uh, the uh, respect of public hearing. So how much uh, uh, the virtual hearing can be uh, in some way um, uh, balanced with the possibility for the public to have access to uh, these uh, this, um, this, this, uh, hearings. And uh, I'd like to also, and this is also part of my question, which goes uh, to uh, Judge um, Thierry uh, Naden. Uh, and uh, my question will be, how did you deal with the aspect of uh, public hearing, did you provide the aspects? Uh, did, did, did you provide access to uh, the public uh, for what regards uh, hearings, or uh, uh, this was uh, something like an issue for for you in the uh, during the pandemic and also after the pandemic? Let's say. Um, I think. Uh, um, Another issue that has not been addressed, which uh, I would like to discuss with the, all the three presenters, uh, is the issue regarding the identification of subjects. So uh, is the use of uh, virtual readings in some way, in some cases, uh, not really compliant with the uh, uh, capacity of, uh, uh, um, of identifying the uh, parties or the subjects that are uh, in some way uh, that are invited or that are um, uh, uh, part of the of the hearings, and uh, and if for you in your experience this represented a, a, an issue, um, on the basis or of of uh, of this uh, um, let's say of this consideration, I have uh, also some uh, some questions for all uh, for all the three presenters. First of all, uh, one for uh, uh, Judge uh, Naden. Uh, I uh, I have a curiosity. So uh, first of all, do you think that uh, uh, I mean what uh, the use of uh, virtual readings uh, uh, in your case uh, was more an adaptation from uh, systems that you uh, were already using uh, also before the pandemic, and uh, if they were already in place, uh, in some way the pandemic in some way changed uh, the way you. Uh, utilize this kind of systems and uh, um, and if uh, you also in some way had the opportunity to uh, test the system on, on the on the basis of their uh, impact of the norms of rule of law and, and if you had a sort of uh, adaptation 
And then I have uh, a consideration regarding the consultation of stakeholders in order to discipline the, the use of this, uh, of this uh, um, technology. Uh, as I said, uh, it was very interesting, the case of the Immigration and Refugee Board of Canada, where uh, they, had a huge, they did a huge work uh, for the design of systems, uh, uh, which was uh, based mainly on the uh, involvement of, stake of stakeholders, uh, let's say lawyers, for instance. And uh, my question would be if uh, uh, also in the case of uh, the uh, Quebec courts, uh, uh, you had this kind of, uh, um, this kind of uh, process that uh, saw the involvement of uh, stakeholders in order to discipline the use of these technologies. Um, so, um, and also, I have a question regarding regarding the use of plain language. I think uh, the, for uh, people that have uh, citizens, let's say, that has to be involved in uh, virtual hearings, uh, it is very important to understand how these are regulated, uh, which are the procedures that will be followed, and the use of plain language uh, and the, the adaptation, of, let's say, of the legal language to the public is a, is a a very import, important process, at least from my point of view. And uh, I would like to ask uh, if also in the, the other two cases, in the arbitration case and in the courts of Quebec case, uh, you had, uh, let's say, um, you had in mind this issue and you worked in order to improve the access of information for, uh, for the public. Um, so uh, another issue which uh, I introduced is uh, the electronic submission of documents with the uh, juridical value. This is something that has been, as I said, that has been really pushed in the last three years uh, in Italy with uh, several implications. Also implication from the uh, side of efficiency, I think, because uh, the uh, functioning or malfunctioning of, of the system may have a great impact on uh, procedural aspects as the procedural deadlines, for instance. So the system has to be up and running always. And if, it's, if it is not, how this may impact the uh, procedure? This is a question that can be addressed to all the three of you. But my question will be also to, uh, Court of Quebec, or to the uh, judge Nadan again regarding the Court of Quebec, if you foresaw the uh, use of systems for e electronic submission, or if you, you simply utilized the uh, email uh, systems already that were already in place uh, by just uh, guaranteeing to them a legal validity. Uh, I have another question. It's, uh, it is more a sort of curiosity. I'm not a practitioner, as you may imagine. But we talk about uh, credibility, and uh, I was wondering uh, why we, uh, why you as practitioners uh, see the aspect of credibility as a ne negative aspect in uh, virtual hearings. It is not more like uh, if we don't have, uh, let's say, the possible, um, uh, let's say, um, um, the, the perception. If we don't have the visual perception. Uh, then we can we can have a more impartial uh, decision on a, on a person. So we, we uh, let's say um, um, taking aside you know the uh, the visual perception, the perception we look more on the facts and on the evidences. It is more like that, or uh, this aspect of credibility is really important. And uh, above all, with regards of the physical presence of person during uh, uh, very important hearings. Um, so I think I'm almost uh, done with my uh, question. Uh, um, I have a question for uh, Stephanie Cohn. Uh, I really thank uh, um, Ms. Cohn for the, for the presentation. It was very interesting regarding the context of arbitration. And uh, I, since I saw from, uh, understood from, uh, from your presentation that uh, there were, uh, uh, I mean, Differently from the beginning, there were uh, there is uh, up until now um, a real push for the use of uh, virtual readings, and uh, let's say it is um, more seen as a positive aspect. But do you think there are areas or procedure where it is better not to have a virtual readings, and it is better to have in-person readings? And if you uh, if it is so, if you can explain to us. Then a final question will be uh, for all of the presenters, uh, but above all for uh, for let's say uh, let's for all 
immigration for the immigration board of canada but also for the courts uh, of quebec regarding the use of uh, uh, let's say systems which are developed uh, by private companies don't you think that uh, by uh, just uh, um, uh, i mean uh, uh, relying on uh, the uh, use of a system developed by privates, uh, you have a sort of impact on, on the independent functioning of uh, uh, these public institutions. And don't you think this better, I mean, I understand that we were in, a, in an emergency situation, we had to deal uh, with the, the problem of uh, ensuring access to justice with what we have in, in, uh, in, in our hands, but don't you think that it would be better to have more secure systems, uh, which are more, uh, in some way, controlled by the public. So thank you very much for the time that you uh, gave to me. And uh, I leave the floor again to Fabian. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Gian Piero. Gian Piero is, uh, uh, is a researcher at the Research Institute of Legal Informatics and Judicial Systems uh, at the National Research Council uh, of Italy. Uh, he's uh, active uh, worldwide in cyber justice projects, and particularly uh, he's recognized as an expert in the evaluation uh, of uh, methods and frameworks for uh, e-justice uh, systems. Uh, so I'm very pleased uh, to uh, have him uh, put uh, questions to uh, to our panelists. jean Piero, I will ask you to uh, <clears throat> Uh, and I apologize for this. I didn't catch the first question that was addressed to Justice Nadon. So I don't know if you can find that question in your notes or in your mind. Um, ah, that's too that bad. Was, okay. Was that, the first question I think, about I think, public access and the identity of subject? So it was yeah. about public access and identity of subjects. Is that right, Jean Piero? Yeah, yeah, probably yes. Yeah. Very good. So I, I will start with uh, with Justice Nadon uh, with the questions, and I've taken note of all the other topics, uh, and I'll I'll just leave uh, all of the panelists the opportunity, or give them the opportunity to answer any one uh, of them. Uh, so the, the the first point was whether uh, the pract practices and systems were adaptation of things that we did pre pandemic. Uh, the second was about the consultation of stakeholders before deploying particular systems. The third one was about uh, plain language versus legal uh, language. And this was particularly addressed at uh, Justice Nadon and Stephanie Cohen. Um, there was a question about uh, the impact of electronic submissions on procedure, uh, possible impacts on procedure of electronic submissions. There was a question of about credibility of witnesses. Uh, there was a question addressed particularly to Stephanie about uh, any areas uh, where um, virtual hearings uh, should not be used and, and why. And uh, the last one is about the use of uh, private systems or private technology uh, on the independence of the justice system uh, in, in general. Uh, we certainly had some problems in North America and the United States in particular uh, about the ownership of the data that was collected by the judicial system in some states, uh, which was in the hands, in, in private hands uh, for, uh, for some reason at, at some stage. So that's an example. So uh, I will start with Justice uh, Nadal. You can speak to any of those questions and, or all of those questions. Okay, so and, I'll, I'll, I'll try to be brief and touch upon all of the questions. First of all, the public and the identity of the subject. Um, that is an issue. Uh, of course, the, uh, the open court principle is the uh, main principle of law in Canada. So uh, the court is public uh, and people can can show up and listen to the cases. Um, so that's an issue with uh, virtual hearing. That said, uh, most of the hearings are open. Um, for example, I was uh, presiding over the appearances this weekend and uh, people could connect uh, as they wish, uh, but there is a discretionary power of the justice to, uh, to permit the people to join or not. As for the identity of the subject, that's that's a that's an interesting issue. Um, 
I've had, I haven't had any problems yet, but I can see that there could be problems. Uh, for example, just by the identification of your name down on the computer, that's one of the issue. Uh, but mostly when in criminal court, we deal with uh, attorneys. And so the attorneys can identify the people who will appear as witnesses, as counsel, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and when you practice in criminal law, it's a small world. It's a big world, but it's a small world. So you tend to recognize the people that uh, participate. And, and some, for example, the technological glitch, uh, we don't see them, but, but we hear them by phone. So if they appear, a counsel appears by phone, well, I can recognize them because I, I, I see them on a regular basis. But that is an issue with the identity of, sub, of the subject. Was there an ad adaptation with what we did before? Yes, because it was more of an exceptional way of proceedings. We used to have, uh, and we still have, the possibility of hearing witnesses via video conference or audio conference for witnesses outside of Canada or outside of Quebec uh, that uh, could not uh, be in Montreal. It was not efficient for them to be in Montreal, et cetera, et cetera. So yes, it was something to adapt because it was more of an exceptional um, way of proceeding. But that said, uh, as with anything in this day and age, we have had to adapt very rapidly. And I, I think we've succeeded in that. The third thing was the involvement of the stakeholder. Well, it, that's a, it's a work in progress, as I would say, uh, same thing as, as uh, Joshua uh, and Stephanie were saying, um, it's a work in progress and we, we still have to get the feedback on, on where we're going and what to improve. Uh, are we going to use more of technological um, resources for filing of documents, filing of exhibits, et cetera, et cetera? The answer is yes, there's a project in Quebec called Lexium uh, that is underway. And uh, the, the first aspect of that project might be coming soon. I mean, it's a huge, huge uh, project. And, but this is something that's coming in the justice system here in Quebec. As for credibility, it's a good point that credibility assessment is not just looking at a witness, hearing a witness. It's a lot about what the witness says. But if you look at the, what the Supreme Court said and the correct Court of Appeal says, uh, there is still part of evaluating credibility by looking at someone, by hearing someone, by how someone speaks, how someone does not speak. So there's still a, a part of evaluating credibility that comes from seeing someone now and hearing that person. Now, is it the same uh, by a Teams platform? I argue that it's not, but as I said before, this is something that we'll, we'll get used to it. I mean, it's, it's a rather a, a huge change. As I was saying, it's, it was exceptional at the time to have witnesses via a video conference, but it's not something that's impossible, but it is different. And we have to be remind, we have to remind ourselves that there is still a huge part of evaluating credibility that's looking at someone, hearing someone, and hearing how that person speak. It's part of it. Uh, and just to plain language, we've tried plain language, but I think we try that. And there is uh, on the website of the Colts Quebec, I, I hope it's plain language uh, that people, it's not too much of legal lingo that people can understand, but that's for lawyers and for judges and for uh, professors and from legal law students, it's difficult once you have that training to go back to plain language. I think it's a, <laughs> it's something that's difficult for, for people to go back to, uh, but always to be mindful that it's, the, uh, it's for the public, the justice system. And so we have to uh, deal with plain language and be as um, clear as possible. Now, as for the, uh, the fact that it's a private company, that's more of a government uh, responsibility and I know that uh, this was an issue that was raised and uh, the government of Quebec uh, uh, I'm sure did what they had to do and now we uh, were using the Teams platform but uh, as you were saying uh, Jean Pierre, this is an issue and I'm sure the government did look at it. Yes we, 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 we also have that uh, that server location uh, issue. Uh, with Canadian information subject to 
American legislation uh, giving vast powers of, uh, of investigation to the executive branch of government. Uh, but I, I, I understand that Microsoft does offer uh, a service to host uh, the information for particular systems in Canada. Um, so, Joshua, would you like to speak to uh, some of these uh, points that Jean Pierre uh, raised? Yes, I thought I would uh, touch on a couple of the main points. Uh, one was about the question of credibility. And I think that my answer to that would essentially be that it should take us back to the basic best practices of how we should always uh, been approaching credibility, but there can be certain concerns uh, that are always concerns and can be particular to the virtual hearing environment. In the refugee status determination context, a lot of what we might do when determining credibility in a Canadian context doesn't apply as much because we're involved, we're determining status of individuals from foreign countries, describing events where little may be known about them, speaking foreign languages through an interpreter. And uh, because of that, it's very important that we have strong reasons for making any credibility determination and be very skeptical about relying on demeanor because of biases that can be involved in that. And I think that that's a principle that probably applies across most all branches of law, but may apply with particular force in the refugee context. And one of the things that we've tried to be careful to guard against is the way that uh, subtle uh, subconscious effects uh, can affect how we do those sorts of determinations. So, um, for example, there have been uh, journal articles written about the refugee context, looking at the way that subtle lags inherent in technology can affect perceptions of credibility uh, based on psychological uh, research. And, uh, and that's something that we've provided training to board members about so that this is something that should be considered when saying that we need strong reasons to determine um, credibility and that like somebody's gut is not a uh, strong basis for that not consistent with our obligation of reasonableness. In terms of the other question about how this was an adapt adaptation of things that we did pre-pandemic. I just thought I'd touch on a couple of um, aspects of that. One is we can look back at past legislative debates. The immigration legislation in Canada was overhauled around the year 2000. And at first, the bill for the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act that was introduced in Parliament um, included a clause uh, th um, stating that the um, proceedings um, must um, be held in the presence of the interested parties and uh, that and that they must conduct a hearing in the presence of the foreign national um, concerned was the wording of that bill. And that got changed and they introduced a different clause, which is now section 164 of the act, which actually says that a, a hearing may in the division's discretion be conducted um, by means of live telecommunication was the phrasing there. And so there was a debate that happened about 20 years ago on these issues that led to changes in the legislation. And we're guided by a lot of the um, foresight and discussions that happened at that time. And we've been able to build upon decades of experience uh, doing studies that we did uh, decades ago where we looked at virtual proceedings and we looked at remote proceedings and video conference proceedings between our offices at that point. And they emphasize certain principles, things like the importance of an individual being welcomed to their hearing by somebody who would put them at ease and introduce them into the process and provide an appropriate introduction to the proceedings. And those are all principles that we just try and carry forward to this day. 
the last piece very briefly on using systems developed by private companies and i really see sort of two main aspects to that one is about security the other is about user interface in terms of security that was non-negotiable for us we needed to have a secure system that would store data in canada within the control of the government of canada and it took us a number of months in order to launch that uh, but that is the system that we were able to uh, deploy. But there's a second aspect about the user interface where right now we've tried to do certain things. We have different backgrounds with different colors so that it's easy to differentiate between an interpreter or the, those who are part of the tribunal, those who are representing other parties like the government. But we still use a relatively stock implementation of Microsoft Teams. And the other tribunals around the world and we too are thinking about and looking at how we can deploy a version that's more appropriate for a quasi judicial context where there may be more fixed locations on the screen where you know oh the decision maker is always going to be the one on the upper left and this is where the interpreter is things like that we haven't gotten to that point yet but i think that's where we will be in the coming years Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Joshua. One, one thing that came to my mind is the uh, you now have empirical data about uh, people feeling much less stress uh, with uh, remote hearing than they feel in a, uh, an in-person in hearing. Uh, it must be easier to lie uh, when you're less stressed. <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm, did, did you want to speak to this? or? Um, yes. So... I mean, there, there's a num there's a number of aspects uh, of that from the procedural like things like the way that we've modified yeah, very, very, scripts very and whatnot. Okay, but I mean, ultimately, um, we um, have an in have an investigatory and inquisitorial function that's also um, supplemented by the investigatory functions of other parts of the government of Canada, and so we, when evaluating credibility are doing so by looking at it against the baseline of what occurs in this country, is this plausible or not? But then also the use of technology has greatly aided our ability to assess and verify information, to have witnesses connect from another country and then compare what they say to what the claimant is saying in a hearing. And so the, these things can both create issues, but also present real opportunities for the transformation of our processes. Very good, very good, very good point. A very good point. So, in 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 uh, two minutes, uh, Stephanie, if you want to react to a few, a few of the, the points that were raised by Jean Pierrot, there's also a question from uh, the audience about uh, witnesses being prompted during questioning by. Using using text messages, it's something you spoke to already, I think, Stephanie. Yeah, so I mean, I think that is less of a less of a concern. Um, frankly, it, it's kind of you can kind of tell some things that people are doing if their just attention is is distracted. Um, so that really hasn't been something that I think has been a prevalent um, concern. So, so why don't I just try and turn to address the question that John Perro asked about, you know, circumstances in which it might be better to have a virtual hearing versus not. So, you know, I think particularly in the post pandemic world, if we assume that you're in an instance where you have the authority to make the determination and you're faced with an objection, um, it really is, you know, supposed to be this individualized, what makes sense in the circumstances of the case. So the nature of the objection, what's the reasons for the objection, I think is, is paramount. If there are technical reasons, concerns about infrastructure, for example, as we've discussed, a lot of those things can hopefully be mitigated, but you'd certainly have to um, evaluate that. Um, in terms of factors that arise more commonly in the international context, time zones can be very difficult to navigate. In a pandemic, we have started, um, we've heard hearings in the middle of the night. Um, people have been willing to do that in order to make sure that hearings take place. But there are times where you have completely incompatible um, time zones. I've had a case five different time zones, and there are only so many hours in the day where there's, there's sort of a reasonable 
ability for us to say, I'm willing to put myself out there, but I'm not my best at two o'clock, you know, to four o'clock in the morning and how many hours a day can I have? So time zones in the international context is a, is a huge driver to something that we'll see some cases just cannot very easily be, be, be done online in the, in the future. Um, I think language interpretation um, generally, I, I found the experience with consecutive language interpretation works very well. And for many interpreters, they seem to have a better experience access to things like real time transcripts when otherwise they couldn't hear witnesses as well, or their seating, their proximity to the witness in the hearing room. They may not have been as close as they would like. Um, so that I have, I, I think has worked quite well and is, shouldn't generally be an impediment. Simultaneous translation, um, my understanding is that that does not work, um, not work as well. So in instances where that's really quite important, I think that that will be um, a driver. Um, one of the things I think that's important to, to emphasize about arbitration versus the other context is that this is a private dispute resolution um, mechanism. And so we have the ability in a lot of instances to make determinations of costs. So if, if there were a determination that, you know, one side felt very strongly that it was important to have a witness in person because they felt there were credibility issues at play, for example, and they really made a strong argument on that fact, you know, a tribunal might make a determination that it'll hold the hearing in person, but at the end of the day, um, it, it will decide how it's going to award costs related to holding that, that hearing, um, you know, in, in person. So I think that will make a big difference. Um, going forward. And I'd say there's sort of some soft factors that we haven't discussed at all that are harder for uh, people to talk about uh, in terms of an objective evaluation. If there were an application being made um, by one side to say, I want to have this uh, in person, it's important to have it in person. Things like your ability to be in the same room as the other side that, and the extent to which that promotes settlement. Um, in, in an arbitration context, particularly in larger value cases, we often have three tribunal members. So what's the rapport between the tribunal? Uh, I've had instances where we're able to communicate um, online during the context of, of the hearing, uh, and, it's been, and it's been fine. We know each other well, or, or we just have a, an easy ability to confer. We go into visual breakout rooms during lunch breaks. Not all tribunals have the same kind of um, rapport. You don't get to go to dinner with each other. And you can, un you can say, well, to what extent does that matter? If you're over the context of a two week hearing, getting to know your fellow decision makers, having less uh, inform more informal uh, conversations is really, I think, an important part of the process. So there are some of those kind of softer factors um, that enter the, in there as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephanie. I, this brings us to the end uh, of our time. I want to thank all of our uh, panelists for uh, a workshop, which I, I thought was, uh, was great. I, I learned a great deal. Uh, certainly. There are uh, two things in the chat I want to draw attention to. Uh, the first one is um, uh, Stephanie Cohen has put the registration link for uh, the launch of the ICC report that she uh, mentioned. You can register using that link. And I have Susan McDonald who's telling us that Justice Canada will be including some questions about virtual testimony in its upcoming public opinion research called the National Justice Survey Research 2022. So she's trying to collect um, information, other data on the Canadian public's confidence in virtual testimony. So anything that can be uh, sent uh, could be sent to me at fabien.gelina at mcgill.ca and I will relay the uh, information or you can send it using the chat function as long as the uh, room is open. So again, I want to thank Valentin Calipel uh, for uh, the, his work on the design of this workshop. And I want to thank all of our panelists for a wonderful uh, morning uh, spent with you all. And thanks to our participants. Thank you. And thank you very much to Fabien. Thank you very much. Great sharing. So have a great day to you all. And thank you very much for your participation. Bye -bye. Greatly appreciated. Thank have you.